Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 260, featuring the first installment of a new interview series with Mr. Robert Woodhead of the Wizardry series. And now Robert co-developed or co-designed this series with Andrew Greenberg, and it's one of the most influential computer role-playing games, if not just influential computer games, period, of all time. Now in this first part of the interview, we don't, we don't talk so much about wizardry. Uh, we're going to bring that up in the, the second episode. Uh, so here we talk mostly about his uh, latest projects, uh, some stuff involving Kickstarter and his uh, Animago project. You might not know this, but in addition to the uh, working on the wizardry games, uh, Robert also was instrumental in bringing anime uh, to the United States. So really important guy in many different areas. Uh, we also talk here about the Plato Network and the Apple II and much, much more. It's really fun stuff. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Woodhead. Hello, folks. I am here with none other than the great Robert Trevor Woodhead. He is the co-founder of Surtech, a company you're probably familiar with if you watch the show. He's an entrepreneur, software engineer, games programmer. Uh, he likes to describe himself, though, as, uh, quote, somebody who, does, somebody who likes to do uh, weird shit with computers. It's also known as the Mad Overlord. Uh, how are you doing today, Robert? I'm fine, thank you. I thought we could start by talking about this new Kickstarter project. It's got a, as I'm recording, the 17 days left, and you've already met the, you know, I think what at least doubled the goal there. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, uh, the goal is only 100 bucks. Yeah, well, you know, it's all relative, I guess. But uh, anyway, that project's called Backer Support. I was getting kind of a kick out of the, I think you were too, the sort of recursive uh, nature of this thing, right? But uh, So it's a Kickstarter management and logistics app. So I wonder if you just you know, kind of talk about that a little bit and why you thought it was necessary. Um, well, uh, last year I did a Kickstarter to do a Blu-ray release of um, one of the real classic anime series, Bubblegum Crisis. Um, and... Uh, we ended up kind of mutating the project into uh, something that got the actual backers involved uh, in the production decision making and actually some of the actual production uh, design work as well. Um, and so this thing got, I, I was asking for 75 grand and it got oversubscribed two to one. Um, and so I ended up with like over 2000 backers around the world. Um, and when I started looking into, um, ways to deal with the logistics of, uh, shipping out, uh, all these units to all these different people and keeping track of them and people wanted to upgrade and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of, of sort of web-based solutions that people had built to try and solve this problem, but none of them really um, addressed my needs. So I kind of rolled my own database out of FileMaker. Um, and it got to the point where um, it was just such a, a complicated app with all sorts of different features that I thought that uh, it would be powerful enough for other people to use. So I just spent the last month um, updating the uh, the app and making it sort of more user friendly for uh, for people who aren't me, and and also generalizing it so that um, uh, it can adapt to different people's project situations. And uh, so basically, the result of this Kickstarter I did last year is a pro is an application that helps you run kickstarters so i was just going to release it and then one of my backers said no 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 you have to run a kickstarter for it <laughs> and you know at, at that point the sort of recursive nature of it was just uh, too um silly to not do so i did that's the idea that you're going to sell this to kickstarter or Indiegogo i'm just going to give it away if they want to pay me fine they can send me whatever they think is fair mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Uh, so you mentioned the Bubblegum Crisis uh, Ultimate Edition Blu-ray set. And I, I know, again, you seem to be really, I guess you've done two so far, right? And they're both you know, gone well over the uh, the initial goals. Uh, that one got, I guess you were asking for 75000 You got 154000 Now, i got to admit, uh, Robert, I don't know much about anime. <laughs> 
Uh, so maybe, you know, I, I was kind of wondering why, I guess you have a lot to choose from, so why would why'd you go with this particular one? And uh, also I was thinking we could get into a little bit about, uh, is it Animigo? Animago. Animago, Wilson. you know, what that is. and Because uh, it seems to me, you know, from what I've been able to gather here, you were really instrumental in bringing anime to the United States. Well, uh, I think it was something that was going to happen no matter who did it. Um, I was just in the right place at the right time, and it seemed like an interesting project. And uh, initially, for me, it was a programming project, uh, getting uh, Macintosh 2 to do subtitles. Um, and uh, it sort of just evolved from that. And we, we released Bubblegum Crisis on VHS tape. We re-released it on Laserdisc, on DVD. Um, and now we're doing it on Blu-ray. Um, uh, and it's just like one of my favorite series. So it was sort of a natural thing to do. What's so great about the, that particular series? Uh, it's a cool science fiction series. Uh, it was one of the first uh, direct-to-video anime series. Um, it had, it, it really was one of the first anime series to really weave, uh, music into, into the storyline a lot. Um, and it's just sort of generally cool. I've always liked it. It's got a very Blade Runner dystopian future feel to it. Yeah, I really like the, I watched the, I really liked the Kickstarter video for that with the, I think it was Rock On or something like that was the, the song there. Uh, rock Me. Oh, Rock Me. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you were working on the Macintosh 2. That's with the Color Space. You were working with a tool called Color Space 2 for the... Yeah, that was... Color Space 2 was the first um, video board for the Macintosh that let you overlay graphics on top of a video signal. And you were also doing some... Or you did some uh, antivirus stuff for the Macintosh 2? Some... Uh, yeah, um... This was back when the, the first viruses hit uh, for the Mac, and I was on CompuServe at the time, and um, so somebody posted uh, sort of a list of instructions on how you could check um, your, your computer for this virus, and the end of his, his posting said, you know, well, it only took me eight hours to check my hard drive, so you guys shouldn't have too many problems with it. And I just thought to myself, well, geez, in eight hours, I can write a program that will do it for me in about 30 seconds. Uh, well, I was wrong. It took me 12 hours. And so the, but the next day, I posted a, uh, uh, an app to CompuServe that um, would uh, scan your hard drive for the first couple of viruses that were, uh, were, were there and tell you which files you had to delete. Um, and... So a little while later, I got a call from, uh, from this guy uh, named Bob Capon, who was running this little software company. And um, he, he said I, he wanted me to turn it into a commercial product, you know, that did more, that, you know, repaired the files and all that sort of stuff. And I told him he was an idiot. Uh, nobody would ever pay, you know, for antivirus software. I mean, especially when they can just, you know, get it for free because I've already uploaded it for free. And he said, no, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a market for it. Um, and he kept calling me back. He literally called me back almost every day for a month. And finally, I just said, okay, look, I'll do it for you on the condition that you don't talk to me until I'm done. <laughs> and the result of that was a program called Virex, which I, I, I have to admit, he was right. I was wrong. There was a market for it, and, uh, and it did very well for me. What about Animago? That did pretty well for you too, right? This well, I'm still uh, doing it. Company. I mean, did you expect Animago to be successful? You said you thought it was kind of inevitable that you know this would happen, but uh, I mean, did it was it bigger than you thought it would become, or, or what? Oh, I mean, it was started as a joke. It was a weekend fun thing to do, and haha, maybe we'll make money. Um, uh, and it just sort of. Um, grew into a big pro, uh, a big deal on its own. Um, I hadn't intended for that to happen uh, because like uh, after we founded it, um, Ro Adams and I, uh, Ro is the 
one of the other founders of Animago and also the designer of Wizardry 4, um, we moved to Japan to, to work on a game project. Um, and, but unfortunately, the funding for the game project you know, evaporated after about six months. Um, and at the same time, this little fun thing we were doing on the weekends um, exploded uh, in part because we were over there and we could just like walk over to the anime companies and, and say, hey, give us stuff. So did you speak Japanese already or did you have to learn it once you were, once you were in Japan? I, I studied it for six, the six years I was living there and I, I speak it well enough to impress Americans and amuse Japanese people. <laughs> have you ever thought about translating those uh, Japanese wizardry games back into English? Uh, not really. I, I, I enjoy what they've done. I mean, it's, it's, it's neat to see the directions they take it into. And, and when, when Wizardry Online was translated back into English and, and I checked out the beta and it was, uh, it was kind of fun because you, you'd see these little touches that they had taken that had come from the original games um, through uh, the Japanese games and then back into Wizardry Online. And it was kind of cute. Um, but you know, that, that aspect and chapter of my life was, uh, has long been over. Well, you didn't have anything to do with those Japanese wizardry games. And the... I was kind of curious what your take was on them because they do have a lot, at least to me, uh, what do I know, but they seem to have a lot more of an anime style. You know, anime well, that's the, the, the cultural style. filter. Right. What do, what mean, do you mean by, by that? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's the style that they like to do things. So, you know, I have no problem with that. I mean, I worked on the Japanese versions of Wizardry one through four for for uh, on the on the PC, you know, the home computer uh, versions, um, but I didn't work on any of the later stuff. Okay, so a couple. Well, I guess you know, maybe one last question about the modern stuff before we get into what <laughs> I love to talk about. Uh, so, uh, Jack Day wrote in asking about your thoughts on the PC gaming today. I just thought I would append to that, that uh, I see where you, I don't know if this, if you still do or not, but I saw where you were playing a lot of EVE online and we're even the, on the council of stellar management. Is that still something that yep. you do? Um, oh, you got the, the shirt on logo, there. the CSM right there. Wow. So you're pretty hardcore I, I, about I, the EVE retired online. retired from the CSM uh, after four years of indentured servitude. Um, <laughs> And um, and now I just play Eve casually. You play Elite back in the day, Privateer. Uh, I I was uh, never a top sort of level player of the game. Um, I, I dabbled in lots of different things, but um, you know I, I was never great at any one thing. No, I saw where you said you got bored with World of Warcraft after just a couple of months, but there was something about EVE Online that really did it for you. you know, what, what was that? Um, EVE has a much greater depth of social interaction. Uh, you, you don't really play EVE to play EVE. You play EVE to play with your friends. Mm. Yeah, that does something, seem to be something sorely missing from, from WoW. Wow. I mean, the social network in EVE, because it's a single server, everybody can affect everybody else, is, is much deeper in that, uh, you know, if, if you're a jerk to people, you can't just, like, you know, move to a different server. Right. So what, what is there anything else in the PC gaming spectrum that's really appeals to you now or has got you excited? Um, the only other game I'm playing right now with any seriousness, although I haven't really done it for the last six months because I've just been too damn busy, is Kerbal Space Program. Hmm. What, what is it about that game that's... I'm just a huge space nerd. You like space, yeah? Yeah. There seems to be you know, quite a few of those games coming out. I'm also a big fan of that. that I haven't played that particular one, I don't think. Oh, uh, you're missing something. Kerbal's great. Yeah. What was the last one? I, I can't. I think it was Ethereum, Combat, or Space Sim, something like that. So are you thinking about this uh, this backer support Kickstarter project? Have you putting this together with an eye towards uh, the, an, another 
big Kickstarter project that you might launch at some point? Well, I, I'll definitely use it if I run another Kickstarter. And uh, yeah, we're thinking about using the, the, the model to uh, release some classic anime. Uh, the, one of the problems with some of the older, sort of more es esoteric stuff is that uh, the traditional marketing channels just uh, there's too much risk, so you can't, you know, you can't, uh, you can't use the traditional, you know, sell it in Best Buy type of channel. Uh, but with with things like Kickstarter, you can go direct to the customer, um, which means that things become a lot more viable. And in fact, we we did projects like this uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we were actually we were sort of doing it informally, where we were just telling people. Um, if enough people sign up that they'll buy this particular product, we'll go and get the license and, 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 and sell it to you. So we did um, uh, a release of, of a classic series called Macross, where we, we got, um, I think, ended up getting about 7,000 people um, to, to pledge to buy it. And then we went and, and got it, and we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars restoring the, the, um, the video and and doing a release and and it was a fun project well just as somebody like i said i've you know i've seen some of the classic movies you know but i don't know a lot about anime is there you know what's your favorite is there a particular series you think i should i should watch um you should watch my neighbor totoro okay that's my all-time favorite film that's your oh all-time favorite in anime, film. at least. Okay, well, that's on the list. Is that one that you've uh, translated or subtitled? No. no, it's one I wish I had had an opportunity to work on. I just didn't. Disney has the rights. Ah, uh, Disney. All right, so let's get into the old wizardry vaults. I thought I, I was really intrigued because uh, I saw where you did some a lot of uh, gameplay on the Plato. Plato uh, yep. system, and that's you know one of my friends here is a computer science professor, and he's always going on about you know how wonderful and ahead of its time this this system was. And I've you know looked at it some, but I just wonder if you could kind of flesh this out because uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching the show had no idea what you know what the heck it is. And uh, well, I'll just let you describe the platform. This would have been I guess back in the 70s or 60s even early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, this was a nationwide network, uh, hundreds of people using it at the same time, uh, all connected to what at the time was a one of the fastest computers in the world, a CDC Cyber 6600, if I recall correctly. Um, the terminals, um, which all connected over phone lines, effectively a 1200 baud modem, um, were 512 by 512 pixel plasma displays with the ability to um, draw lines and uh, download graphics character sets. Um, they even had a, um, a microfiche player that could shoot images through the back of the screen. In fact, the plasma display technology was invented for Playtime. Um, and Plato is just um, so hugely influential. Um, you know, it it you know inspired a lot of what I did. It inspired a lot of other people. Um, uh, it's Silas Warner of Wolfenstein fame, Plato alumni. Uh, I think Mitch Kapoor was a Plato alumni, if I recall correctly. Uh, Andy Greenberg, the other author of Wizardry. Well, we met and, you know, grew to dislike each other because of Plato. What, grew to dislike? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you guys were the best, best of we, friends. We were, um, when we first met, we didn't like each other. Um, but in any case, uh, Plato, you know, every, everything you love about computers was the odds are good it was invented in the early 70s on Plato, the basic idea. Yeah, touch screens, right? Touch screen? Touch screens, another. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the touch screen. Um, electronic music, 
computer music. They had a device you could plug into the back of the Play-Doh terminal that would play music. Um, it, it was, you know, electronic mail, news groups, spelling checkers, desk accessories, chat, multiplayer games, you name it. Yeah, you played, uh, what was it, Oubliette? Oubliette? Oublier, Avatar, Oublier. Empire. Yeah, Empire. I was wondering if you played Empire because it seems like that's, you know, might, might tie into your later uh, Evil Online. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, uh, Empire is one of the finest games ever written. So it must have been quite a step, you know, to have this, uh, you know, Play Doh computer that you're playing with. And then you start to see the Apple II, you know, show up, which is, of course, a much less. Uh, much less power than that, but yet something about it must have sparked your imagination. Well, I, I think the, the cool thing about the, the early home computers, at least from a programming perspective, um, was that you could, um, you could hold the entire state of the machine inside your head. You could completely and totally understand Everything that machine could do, you know, every register, every memory address. I think you could probably do that. I don't know if I could do that. But, but the point was they were, they were complicated enough to be able to do insane things, but yet you could, mo you could model them in your own head. You could, you know, the instruction sets were s complex enough to do cool things, but simple enough that you could actually write in assembly language without having to continually refer to manuals. I mean, you, you could, these days with the x86 instruction set, you know, it's very hard for a human to, like, think in that language. We all use compilers now, but, but those machines were simple enough that you could still do that. Sounds like you get a lot closer to the machine itself than you can now with all the you know, sort of middle, middleware, I guess. Yeah, you, 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 you were down on the bare. If you wanted to do some things, you were down on the bare metal, and that that was um, a lot of fun. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of my interview with Robert. And yes, we will be getting into the Wizardry series. Uh, so just stay tuned, all of you Wizardry fans. I, I think you'll like uh, what you see. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys, for supporting uh, me and the Matt Chat Show. If you would like to become a supporter, just go to the Patreon link in the show notes. Only takes a few seconds, and you'll get your name in the credits, and you'll get access to special videos and, and hangouts. As a matter of fact, today we are recording a... Uh, we're not recording, actually. We're hanging out uh, with Clint from the Lazy Game Reviews uh, YouTube show. By the way, it's a fantastic show. But if you're a Patreon supporter, you could join us, uh, ask Clint questions, or uh, even join in, in the video. So we're having lots of fun with that. Really like to see you there. So uh, please, you know, consider signing up a dollar, you know, per episode. Not asking that much, guys, but I really appreciate it. Uh, also, I uh, said in the last episode, I'm trying to reach 25,000 subscribers. Uh, at, at which point I will make a gold box uh, feature film, a movie about one of the best uh, computer role-playing game series of all time. And uh, so far, this is really, this, this is sort of subscriber drive thing is uh, way more than I anticipated. I'd already picked up 73 new, <laughs> 73 new subscribers uh, just in the, you know, the week after. I don't even think it's been a full week. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. But it's just uh, people like you uh, tweeting about the shows, uh, mentioning it on Facebook, on forums or I guess just even uh, emailing people that haven't heard about the show but would like the sort of things we do here. You know, uh, there's got to be lots of people out there that would love to, to watch these interviews with Robert Woodhead. So if you know somebody like that, uh, you can't just assume they've already, they already know about the show. So uh, please let them know and uh, we can add them to the Matt Chat ranks. So anyway, thank you guys for helping out with that. All right, what about the news from the Matt Cave? Oh, got some awesome, got some Bad news and some good news, I guess I could put it that way. Um, and they're kind of both combined in one item. So Pillars of Eternity, you know, this is one of those uh, big Kickstarter projects. 
Yeah, some people are more excited about this even than, than we're about the Wasteland 2. Uh, this is uh, going to be huge, but the, apparently they have uh, extended their uh, release date or pushed back or pushed forward, I guess, their uh, release date. So they were talking about, I guess, uh, this year. Uh, that's been delayed to early 2015. So they're kind of leaving that a bit vague. And I was trying to find out more about this, why they delayed it, and uh, I just really wasn't able to find out much. I really, maybe uh, you guys can enlighten me, but uh, from all I could see was something about feedback they had received. I don't know if that's uh, their beta testers or <laughs> what's going on there. Uh, but anyway, I say it's kind of good and kind of bad. It's kind of bad, we're gonna have to wait longer. Uh, but on the, on the positive note, I know a lot of great role-playing games that were rushed out uh, before they were really ready. Uh, they just didn't give the team enough time to, to really polish it, to get all the bugs out. So, you know, if it's, if it's going to push uh, a couple of months out, even as much as a year, <laughs> I'm actually okay with that as long as the game we get is uh, worth the wait. Uh, so, anyway, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, now, some other news, and this is very, very exciting stuff. Uh, Augustin Cordes... One of the longtime uh, friends of the show, it's probably not even a stretch to actually call him a, just a friend of uh, mine personally, he has a, announced a new Kickstarter project. Apparently they've got a hold of the HP Lovecraft license, and they're making the uh, first official HP Lovecraft um, game. I think I read that right. Maybe I got the details wrong. <laughs> but anyway, it's a official HP, HP Lovecraft stuff. It's a game called The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Now they've uh, launched a Kickstarter for this. I've already uh, gone over there and pledged. At 150 bucks, you get the uh, T-shirt and a bunch of other uh, great stuff. But you know, August Augustine has uh, really been a, a huge supporter of Match Hat. Uh, so if you guys uh, like the show, you know, please go over there and pledge to this. I mean, besides, it's just an awesome game. And I mean, I tell you, if anybody can make a really scary H.P. Lovecraft game worth. Uh, the license it is this man i mean if you if you've never played scratches uh, go go play the game it's going to scare you uh <laughs> anyway it's going to scare you so i'm really looking forward to this so please go over there and check that out and a uh, final bit of news i have a uh, launched a match chat group on steam uh, so you can join the group uh, but the main reason i created that was to become a steam curator so I've heard this was a good way to promote uh, shows like Matt Chat, so I went ahead and set this up. And I went through and picked out, uh, I guess, about 20, 20, 20, 20 or 25 games uh, that I really like. Uh, so I guess you can look at the list. I'm not uh, all sure what you can do as a member of this group, but I thought you would like to see other games that I recommend. And if there's some that aren't on your list, you can pick them up. Got a little tongue-tied today. All right, I know how to help for that. <laughs> now let's take a look at that Ale of the Week. All right, so this week I've got a Pearl White IPA, a Roots release, whatever that is, from the Odell Brewing Company. Uh, these guys are out of, uh, uh, where are they out of? Uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, I've tried a lot of their beers before, but I hadn't seen this one. I had to buy this a big variety pack to get, to get these, some kind of special release. Inspired by our small batch pilot system, the Roots release series honors our experimental brewing roots and invites you to sample some of our favorites. Uh, herbal, fruit-like hop character mingles with a delicate wheat <laughs> for a clean, crisp finish that will leave you smiling. Well, usually you drink the wheats in the summertime. I don't know about uh, what it's like where you are, but we're starting to get a little chilly here in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I think it was down to 40s, uh, the 40s today. <laughs> a very fun bike ride over uh, to pick up this uh, this brew here. Let's see, 5.5% alcohol by volume. So it's not actually very strong at all, so this should be quite drinkable. Uh, anyway, I like IPAs and I like white ale, so we'll see how the combination goes. All right, so I'm here with the uh, Pearl White APA from the Odell Brewing Company. I've been smelling it. I'm a little st a little stuffy today, so probably won't be able to do this justice. However, I definitely detect the uh, the aroma of rat urine in this. It's uh, quite nice. Also, uh, the hops are really standing out. I can tell this is, this will probably be, be uh, quite bitter. Uh, so I'm actually kind of in the mood for some bitterness. Uh, so that that'll be fine. Uh, otherwise, not really uh, smelling. That I would not assume this was a, a wheat. 
uh, just by smelling it. So let's give it a taste. Definitely a bit on the, uh, what is that? <laughs> Ooh, a bunch of uh, flavors kind of hits, hits you all at once. I uh, definitely taste the wheat uh, element here. Uh, it's definitely also a bit on the hoppy side. That sort of grape nuts like uh, flavor that you get with these. Uh, the bitterness is really high up on the palate. Um, it's very unusual. I'll, I'll try it again. It's kind of, I mean, the flavors are just all over the place with this. It's really uh, doing a number on my palate, trying to uh, identify the different flavors. Uh, mostly what I'm tasting is the bitter and the sort of uh, a grape-like flavor. Not quite sure where it's all coming from. Uh, it's actually quite tasty, though. I mean, the bitterness, it's not so bitter that you can't drink it. It's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite nice, actually. That's a, you know, it's definitely an interesting beer. Um, it's a very comp uh, complex flavor. Not going to say it's my favorite, though. Uh, I guess if you just really want something uh, unique, uh, you can uh, look for this one. Uh, but just as far as taste goes, I'm only I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely interesting. It's got a nice flavor, but uh, just not something that I would want to drink six of. <laughs> I mean, let's put it that way. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations, and I found one from Cicero. Uh, we've been reading him in my, my rhetoric class, and found a really good quote from him. I've uh, improved upon it, as you'll uh, see in a minute. I just thought you guys would enjoy it. So, so here it goes. If you have a garden and a games library, you have everything you need. See you guys next week. I've also developed several rudimentary emotions, including fear. Oh my God, it's going to kill us. <laughs> Sadness. Oh my God, it's killed us. <laughs> Happiness. Oh no, it hasn't. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, I've turned into a frog. <laughs> And just lately, I'm proud to say I've got the hang of anger with rudimentary mindless violence. That 